Dealey Plaza, Dallas, a public arena for the brutal slaying of the 35th President of the United States. The assassination of John F. Kennedy on November the 22nd, 1963, in this tiny acre of Texas, changed history and the lives of millions. And for those closest to the tragedy, the awful memories of that day and the ensuing controversy live on. me any differently that the shots came from the area of the picket fence on the grassy knoll. No one will ever convince me. I saw it. I believe that's where it came from. And the only way that I'm ever going to believe any different is be when I stand before the judge on the judgment day and he tells me. But I, I know what I saw. And that's what I saw. Major Phil Willis, with his wife and daughter, was also in Dealey Plaza. He is certain that the fatal headshot came from the grassy knoll. Hell, I'll tell you, 90% of the people in Dallas, Texas, and probably the United States have heard all this over, have since decided that, as well as the second investigation uh, held in the House of Representatives in Washington. And, uh, and no one will ever convince me. I know damn well the shot that blew his head off came from the right front. It had always seemed to me that had the car speeded up, had there been better reaction on the part of the driver, they were only yards from what at least I perceived to be safety by getting on the expressway. But the car seemed to just, it didn't move. After that first shot, it just didn't move. And the thing that has, over the years, continued to rather haunt me about the whole situation was the feeling that did that first shot miss, as I felt it had, if it did miss, had that car speeded up, would he be alive today? Even now, those eyewitnesses closest to the killing suffer their own haunting images from that dreadful day. The head shot, seeing his head blow up, I can see it just as plain. It's red, it's very brilliant, it's cone shape, going back. That's my impression. Sad, but true. I would agree with my mother. The headshot is so traumatic and permanently emblazoned in my mind that uh, that and the sadness of, this, of the assassination, that'll be you know, forever in my memory. Very sad, very sad, very traumatic. Went over on another knoll over the other side of Dealey Plaza and just lay down on the grass and... and uh, uh, vomited and I was just sick and uh, then when we took my film out to uh, Kodak uh, out near Love Field and saw Air Force One taking off and I listened to it on the radio it was hard to believe it was true and uh, I began wondering then I began and I have never stopped wondering to this day what this world might have been like if it had not happened. It's affected my life in many, many ways. I suppose the most immediate effect was, as I said, I stopped being in some ways young on that day. I had been very idealistic, very politically involved. I had really believed that um, you could make changes. I saw that it didn't really matter what you had or what you did. It could all be gone in an instant, no matter who you were or what you had or what you had to offer. It could be gone in a flash. And that's a pretty profound thing to learn at 23 years of age, that it can just end. And for reasons that you have absolutely no control over. So in a sense, I said that was the day that marked the end of my youth. 
And I remember one line that always struck with me at the time. It said, the most profound of sin is tragedy unremembered. And I've never forgotten that line, and I feel almost a duty. I don't get on soap boxes and talk about it all the time. <clears throat> but when, the, when there is an occasion, and particularly within my own family context, I feel it's very important to remind people what happened, and that it can happen again, and that nothing in life is a guarantee. He wasn't just the president elected by some unknown party out there. He was elected by us, the citizens of the United States of America. He was my president, and I felt very personally violated. And then to see him assassinated that way, so graphically, was horrifying. My president. As the motorcade slowly passed the grassy knoll in Dealey Plaza, the shots rang out. Kennedy was dead before his car reached the underpass. When the Secret Service bodyguards finally realized what had happened, there was a frantic four-mile dash along the Stemmons Freeway to the nearest hospital. At Parkland, Kennedy was rushed to Trauma Room 1, where surgeons did everything they could to revive him, despite the massive head wound observed by Dr. Robert McClelland. It was not a small opening at all. I would estimate that um, probably a quarter or at least a fifth of the back right side of the skull was gone. I stepped up and looked, and I could see inside President Kennedy's head on the right side near the back. We call it the occipital parietal area. And the scalp had been torn apart there, and the had been blasted open by the effect of the high-velocity missile. I thought it was probably an exit wound because, generally speaking, uh, high-velocity uh, missiles of that type uh, will enter uh, through a rather small opening and by creating a blast effect and by the tumbling of the bullet, it will then, as it exits the body, leave a large hole, particularly large caliber bullets, uh, like from a 45 or from a, a deer rifle or something of this sort, uh, would cause that kind of massive exit wound. We had taken the casket in the room in the meantime and, and uh, prepared it, and Miss Kennedy came into the room, and uh, she was, you know, standing there looking at him very calm, uh, holding back tears, you know, it's just, it, she was emotional. I mean, not, she was, never, never did cry. And uh, she took a, her wedding ring off her finger and tried to place it on his finger. Of course, his lot larger. And so, uh, you know, struggling with, I got some k tail jelly there that they use and greased his finger and we got it on, up on his finger as far as it can. And uh, then the priest came into the room and administered it last rites to him. They sent for Father Huber. And he was ushered in. There was a huge crowd, of course, milling out in the hall. And he was sort of shoved through the doors. And, and the scene, I'm sure, was overwhelming for him, as it was for most of us. Our president was lying there dead, uh, his wife grief-stricken, and all of us more or less stunned. And uh, so he came in and turned to his little book and started reciting something which he considered appropriate, and Mrs. Kennedy uh, felt that, probably rightly so, that he wasn't giving the proper uh, phraseology at that time, and she said, no, no, don't you understand? The final annunction, the final annunction. And he turned to another place in his book and began reading, which appeared uh, appropriate, and it seemed to have a soothing effect on her, and he he finished uh, the appropriate phrases, and uh, Mrs. Kennedy uh, bent over and kissed her husband and took his ring from his finger. And then she went outside the door of this small room and sat down on a chair immediately uh, outside the room. I didn't see the wounds. Uh, they had him completely, his head uh, was completely wrapped in... Uh, a sheet type bandage. Uh, the body, uh, he was uh, nude. 
when we pick up a body as we train at it. My position was from to take the head, place my hand underneath the head, and the other hand goes underneath the, the back of the, the spine at the uh, waist. Then the peanuts, his hand goes next to mine on the waist and he gets below the knees where we can stretch the person out. And we picked him up and the uh, back of his head felt like a wet sponge. It was just real soft. And uh, as if, you know, it was, uh, you know, a skull was, part of his skull was missing. It was just that soft. While the president lay dead at Parkland, another tragedy was unfolding a short distance from downtown in the Oak Cliff District, where police officer J.D. Tippett had been gunned down by an unknown assailant. It came out over the radio that uh, the suspect had gone into the Texas Theater. Well, we continued on into the Texas Theater, and uh, Kenneth and I entered the theater, and about the time we entered, well, some more officers came in behind us, and there were also some officers around the back. While we were in the theater, probably 150 to 200 people had gathered out front the theater, attracted there by all the noise. They had been told on television that the president had been shot. At this point, nobody knew whether he was dead or not. Uh, all these things happening this close together, uh, they thought probably the suspect we had uh, was maybe connected with the, the shooting of the president. And so we were hearing yells like, get him, let's kill him, let's take him. And we were all thinking, well, we just had to risk our lives and fight over a gun to get the man. And here we are, we may have to shoot somebody else to keep him. When uh, Oswald was first brought into the homicide office, I heard this commotion and I looked up and I saw him. He was handcuffed with his hands handcuffed behind his back. And at that time, he refused to tell me who he was. He said something to the effect, well, you're the cop, you figure it out. Later that day, Detective Rose led a search of the house in Irving, where Oswald's wife, Marina, lodged with her friend, Ruth Payne. Six officers came to the door, uh, and they said they had Oswald in custody for shooting an officer, no reference to the president, and they asked if they could come in. Uh, I asked if they had a warrant, and, and they said no, but we could get one right away, and they were obviously very tense and nervous and and I you know was stunned by their arrival on Saturday morning uh, after the assassination on Friday uh, we went back to the Payne residence in Irving I had obtained a search warrant from uh, Judge Joe Brown jr. and wanted to do a more thorough search than I had previously done of that residence uh, some of the items we found in this search was a photograph of Oswald standing in front of a house with a rifle in one hand, a newspaper in the other hand, and a pistol on his hip. At no time did I suspect he had any kind of gun. You know, that picture showed up later with, uh, that Marina had taken. I recognized the location as the back of their Neely Street apartment, because uh, she'd taken me out there to pick some flowers to take home one time when I was visiting there in the spring before. Uh, and it, as you know, that he was carrying both the rifle and the pistol at that point. Other items we found was, of course, a, a small Minox Minotaur camera, it's called. Uh, it had a uh, roll of film in it. We never did develop that film. It was later turned over to the FBI, so I don't know what turned out to be on that film. We found a great, great uh, amount of communist literature, communist books. Uh, I, I couldn't uh, tell you just what all it was, but it was a large box. And... We brought all the evidence in, and uh, Captain Fritz decided to conduct a further interview of Oswald and had him brought into the homicide office for interrogation. I sat in on that interrogation. Uh, Captain Fritz at one point said, uh, uh, Mr. Oswald, you told us that you had never owned a rifle or a gun or a weapon of any sort. Is that right? And he said, that's right. I never owned a gun in my life. So Captain Fritz showed him the photograph and said, uh, well, how do you explain this? He looked at it and he got visibly mad. He seemed shaken and he said, well, that's just simply my face superimposed on someone else's body there. That's all that is. Another senior detective sitting in on Oswald's high-level interrogations that weekend was Jim Lavelle. Mr. Kelly with the uh, Secret Service 
there was a head of the Secret Service out of Washington had flown in, I guess it was the next day, perhaps on Saturday, asked him if he knew anybody named Alex Heidel. He answered no, and they asked him if he had ever used that name at any time, and he answered no. And he said, well, isn't it a fact that uh, when you were arrested, you had an identification card with your picture on it and that name on it and your billfold? He said, I believe that is correct. And Mr. Kelly said, well, how do you explain that? And he said, I don't. During my uh, tenure with him, he was a very calm and cool and collected individual. All of his answers were very, uh, very concise and to the point. He didn't volunteer information, and uh, he certainly didn't admit to anything. Mr. Kelly also, in the same time that he asked him about the uh, Alex Heidel, he knew that Oswald had been involved in this fair play for Cuba uh, in, in New Orleans. And he asked him, he said, now that the president has been killed, he says, do you think that the attitude of the United States towards Cuba will change? And Oswald looked around to his left uh, where Captain Fritz was sitting, and he said, I believe that I was that I am charged with the murder of the president. Is that correct? And Captain Fritz said, yes, that's true. And he turned back to Mr. Kelly and he said, uh, I uh, don't think that I should answer that because whatever answer I give you might be construed in a different light than what I intended it to be. He said, however, in all countries, and this country is no exception, when a leader of the country he either dies or gets killed or something, there's always a second in command that takes over. And he said, in this case, I believe his name is Johnson. And I don't think that his views towards Cuba are any different than the president. An early arrival at police headquarters was the FBI agent in Dallas who'd been assigned to keep an eye on Oswald prior to the assassination, James Hosty. His behavior when I talked to him on the afternoon of the assassination for approximately one hour was that of a person who was very calm, cool, and collected. He claimed that he was uh, in the lunchroom at the time of the assassination by himself. Uh, he was also asked by Captain Fritz, did he bring a weapon into the building that day? And he said, no, he had not. But he had seen the uh, manager, uh, Mr. Truly, had brought a rifle into the building uh, a day or two before. Uh, this was later checked out and proved to be true that Mr. Truly had brought a rifle in and he's going to go deer hunting with it and shown it to several of the people in the building. The interview was terminated because Oswald was taken out for a uh, lineup. Oswald was placed in four different lineups, three on Friday, a fourth on Saturday. In the first two lineups, Oswald appeared with two police detectives and a jail clerk. These men were wearing clothing quite a bit nicer than Oswald, but moreover, they did not resemble Oswald in appearance. They were heavier, older. One of them had blonde hair. The police were gave fictitious names and occupations. Oswald gave his real name, his real occupation, to Texas School Book Depository. This information was being widely disseminated even by the time of the first lineup. In the second and third lineups, Oswald appeared with men who were quite a bit heavier, older. Some of them had blonde hair. And in the fourth lineup, which was the most outrageous of all, Oswald appeared in the lineup with two teenagers and a Mexican. And in the second, third, and fourth lineups, Oswald complained bitterly to police about the manner in which the lineups were being conducted. And he berated the police, demanded legal representation, and it was very, very apparent to any witnesses that Oswald was the suspect. There are established criteria for the fair and proper conduct of police lineups. By any stretch of the imagination, every rule in the book was violated by the Dallas police in the conduct of each of the four lineups that weekend. When they first filed against Oswald for killing President Kennedy, they put in the uh, complaint that Oswald did kill President Kennedy in the furtherance of an international communist conspiracy. The White House called down to the district attorney and vehemently objected to that, in which then the district attorney removed this statement from the original complaint. Because of this, the White House was extremely upset with the local authorities 
and we were under the strictest orders not to give them any information whatsoever at all about Oswald. This caused them to jump to the wrong conclusion and think that we were hiding something about ourselves when we were really cloaking the information about Oswald's uh, Soviet and Cuban connections. In Mexico City, two months before the assassination, a man claiming to be Oswald had visited both the Soviet and Cuban embassies, demanding a visa allowing him to travel to Russia via Cuba. He was unsuccessful. The American authorities were aware of this trip. I asked him if he'd ever been to Mexico City, and he became quite upset about that. But this was more, he was more startled. Uh, and he said something to the effect, how did you know about that? And then, then, uh, then wouldn't speak about it anymore. Whether it was Oswald or an imposter in Mexico City, it was a connection that the American authorities were anxious to conceal at all costs. James Hostie gives the official explanation for this cover-up. Oswald had been in contact with V.V. Kostikov, who was the Soviet KGB chief of assassinations and sabotage for the Western Hemisphere. I think the fact that Oswald had been in contact shortly before the assassination with a person of that nature, and due to the fact that he had spent three years in Russia, this would have caused the American public to become so outraged that it could have led to World War III. I believe for this reason, they decided that they would keep this from the American public. Whatever the real mission was in Mexico City, the American authorities at the highest level were determined that it should never be revealed. In Mexico City, the CIA agents were instructed to cease and desist their investigation of a possible Castro connection to Oswald's uh, assassinating of President Kennedy. Uh, there was a, a near mutiny among the CIA agents over this order to uh, stop the investigation. Uh, the ambassador to Mexico City stated he was given orders from his superiors to stop the investigation and then commented, well, if the president's own brother agreed with it, I guess we'd have to go along with it, which would indicate to me that uh, Attorney General Robert Kennedy concurred with the order to stop the uh, investigation of the Castro uh, connection to Oswald. In the holding cells of police headquarters in downtown Dallas, time was running out for Oswald. Throughout the relentless interrogations, he had offered no information other than vehemently protesting his innocence of the murders of both the president and Officer Tippett. 24 hours after his arrest, he was still without legal representation. Oswald called me from the jail on Saturday after the assassination. He actually called twice, the first time in the afternoon. He just asked me to try to reach a lawyer that he was trying to get to represent him. And uh, I was, uh, I said I would, because I thought he should have representation, but I frankly was stunned that he called, that he asked for something from me at that point. Um, that was a very brief conversation, and his voice was very flat, uh, detached, like as if there was no momentous event going on around him or around me. And uh, then he called again in the evening to uh, try to reach Marina and just asked for Marina just as if it were any week night after work. <laughs> he normally did call her then. Uh, again, just uh, very detached, very, very uh, separated, it seemed to me, from what was going on. For the rest of that day and most of the following morning, Oswald's time was filled with more unrecorded interviews with police officials. Shortly after 11 o'clock on the Sunday morning, his move to the greater security of the Dallas County Jail began. When we started to transfer him that morning, we brought his stuff down to him, and that included a couple of sweaters. I believe one was a beige and one was a black sweater. And it was a little cool, so we asked him if he wanted to wear one of the sweaters, and he said yes. And I asked him which one, he said, I believe I'll wear the beige one. And he started to take it, and he said, no. I said, I think I, I want to wear the black one. I don't know why, because it, was, it wasn't the best sweater. But anyway, 
took the cuffs off of him and gave him the sweater and he put it on and cuffed him again. And in talking with Chief there, I suggested to him that morning that we take Oswald out of the elevator on the first floor, put him in a car on Main Street where there wasn't any people, and we could be into the uh, uh, county jail before uh, anyone realized that we were transferring him. But he did not agree to that because we were already obligated to transfer him so the press could take pictures and everybody else could see it. So, you know what happened. Ruby shot him. And us holding him, so which is not good. Now the prisoner uh, wearing a black sweater, he has changed from his T-shirt, is being uh, moved out toward an armored car, being let out by uh, Captain Fritz. There is the prisoner. Do you have anything to say in defense? I had Oswald, in addition to being handcuffed to him, I had my left hand hooked into his belt on his right hand side. And I pulled back with him, trying to pull him behind me. But uh, without any leverage, I wasn't able to move him at any distance. What I succeeded in doing was turning his body a little bit. Ruby would have shot him if I had not turned him dead center just about the where the navel is. As a result, by me pulling on him, trying to turn him in that reflex action, he shot him over here about four inches to the left of the navel. The bullet went all the way through him and lodged just under the skin on the right-hand side. Uh, it liked, uh, if it had gone, been a little better, uh, a little higher caliber or more powder in the bullet, it would have gone on through him and hit me approximately in the same place. But it stopped just under the skin, and I could roll it around under the skin just like a seed in a grape. I stood beside uh, Dr. Shires and watched the efforts to uh, salvage uh, Mr. Oswald, I remember that uh, he was uh, given pure oxygen because he was already unconscious and uh, little or no anesthesia. And when the abdomen was opened, one could hear the blood escaping from the aorta. And he received 18 pints of blood within the next few minutes in an effort to resuscitate him. and. Uh, he did recover a blood pressure for a moment or two and began to move his arms. You may recall that the bullet had entered his left chest, had gone through the stomach, the spleen, had torn the superior mesenteric artery on the aorta, gone through the vena cava, passed through the upper pole of the right kidney, buried itself through the liver and into the skin of the abdominal wall on the opposite side. And uh, at that time, there were few, if any, survivors in America of a simultaneous injury to the aorta and vena cava, which was the major injury that Mr. Oswald sustained. I was probably about 25, 20 to 25 feet from the point of the shooting. And I was looking in that direction. And when the shot was fired, it didn't really sound like a pistol shot. It was a muffled sound, but I knew that it was a shot. And my first thought was that probably some older officer that was ready to retire, that was probably, I figured, bereaved and grieved over the shooting of Tippett, that uh, really that's what, that's, my, that's what my first thought was, that it was some policeman that shot him. My first thought was that one of my fellow officers had shot Oswald. But as the crowd began hollering, the gun passed in front of my face, and I grabbed at it, but I missed it, and I kept hollering, somebody get that gun, somebody get that gun. And there was a voice that came from this pile of humanity that said they had the gun, and suddenly I ended up with Ruby. We drove him back into the jail office where we restrained him and began to get handcuffs on him. Chief Curry, along with Captain Fritz and other top administrators, had originally planned uh, it was my understanding to transfer Oswald during the night, but outside political pressures coming from as far as Washington insisted 
that Oswald be shown that he hadn't been coerced into a confession, that he hadn't been beaten, and that the world exposure be granted on this subject. After all, he was an assassin accused in killing the President of the United States. Chief Curry did not have the final say uh, as to when or how Oswald was transferred. It came from, from his superior, which was the city manager at that time. So, again, uh, we knew better than to transfer him under those conditions, but we didn't have any choice. I was uh, fairly certain in my mind when I saw uh, Lee Oswald lying on the floor that he was, he was going to die. And then I went to Parkland Hospital, and certainly he, he, he was dead. And that's when I met his wife, Marina, and his mother, Marguerite. Marina, through an interpreter from SMU, a Russian interpreter, uh, she asked him that uh, could she see the body. And the doctor told me, said that she shouldn't see the body. They have, they just, they just done an autopsy on him and he wasn't even cleaned up yet. But she insisted on seeing him and uh, his mother, Marguerite, was there and she insisted on seeing him. So I took them in to view the body. And there was a tear in the right eye of Lee Oswald and Marina asked through the interpreter was he crying when he died and the doctor responded told her that uh, no some people die with their eyes open some die with them closed but this tear he was not crying when he died Paul O'Connor was a medical orderly who assisted at President Kennedy's autopsy on the night of the assassination. For many years, he was prevented, under threat of court-martial, from talking about his frightening experience. It, it was such a relief when the House Assassination Committee allowed me to talk. Then I could got, get it off my chest. It was such a relief to do that. And I'm glad it was brought out of the closet. At least I don't have to walk around the rest of my life bursting at the seams waiting to say, you people don't realize what I did or what I saw. You just believe what you heard or told to believe. And you know he was shot, you know he was dead, and you know he was buried. And that's all that the general public knew. They didn't know about what we knew. And that was a hell of a feeling carry around with you. In speaking out about what he saw at the Washington autopsy, Paul O'Connor has exposed major discrepancies in the official account of the events of that night, and in particular, the president's wounds. In Dallas, minutes after the assassination, the doctors at Parkland Hospital, in addition to noting a large wound in the back of Kennedy's head, had also observed a small wound in his throat, as Dr. Robert McClelland explains. Dr. Perry told me as I was helping him do the tracheostomy that he had made the incision which goes this direction across the neck for placement of the tube in the windpipe through the little wound that had been in the front part of the neck apparently about here and as I understand nicked the tie a little bit in coming through and um, I estimate from what he told me that the size of that tiny little injury on the front part of the neck was perhaps the size of the end of my little finger, very small. What I would usually think about that kind of wound um, and what I thought about that one from his description of it was that it was most likely an entrance wound. It's all a picture of the throat wound. A nice little neat wound about like this is what they showed in the picture. When it actually was a great big nasty blown out wound. Just a big mess. Why they would say this is what it looked like when it didn't is just beyond me. Because the rendition is just totally fabricated. But the official autopsy photographs are not the only dubious aspect of that night's activities. When somebody is shot and killed, 
they do easily do what they call a legal post postmortem, and that involves uh, plotting a trajectory of a missile where it comes in and goes out, and what angle it was. And we didn't do any of that at all. They weren't really interested. It seems that uh, on uh, how it happened, where it happened from, nobody had mentioned whether he had got shot in the front or the back or the side or what. I remember the Dr. Humes was just about ready to pull his hair out because he was a very meticulous person. And he'd start to do something and everyone at Berkeley would say, don't do that. And he'd just tense all up and we'd have to go to some other procedure. And I thought to myself, this is a very unbelievable, strange night. I felt like I was in some kind of a horror story that was real. But what really scared me was about several days later, after the autopsy, we were ordered into the commanding officer's office, all of us that had anything to do with the autopsy, where we signed orders that stated under penalty of general court-martial, you will not divulge any information or talk to anybody. That's what scared me. Dr. Cyril Wecht, a distinguished forensic pathologist and a fearless critic of the cover-up, believes the truth can still be established. I think it would still be possible, even today, to determine how, in fact, John Kennedy was killed, to be able to prove that there were two people firing. I would like to see a real murder investigation conducted. I would like to see FBI agents and other law enforcement people going to individuals who are involved in the chain of custody, find out where the brain is, find out where the kodachromes of the interior chest wounds are, find out where the microscopic tissue slides are. I would like to see all of the evidence brought together and a thorough scientific analysis undertaken. I would also like to see repeat experiments done shooting a Manneker Carcano with 6.5 millimeter military type ammunition through goat carcasses and human cadavers to simulate the bony fractures in Governor John Connolly. And let's see what those bullets look like. Those things can be done. If they are done, then I am convinced that the Warren Commission report will crumble like a house of cards. And of course, the people on the other side, they're not stupid. They are also convinced that that is what would happen, and that is exactly why such a new investigation is not being undertaken. But the questioning voice of the American people refuses to be silenced. Each year on the anniversary of the assassination, a dedicated band of disbelievers meet on the grassy knoll in Dealey Plaza, typical of those millions of Americans who have refused to swallow their government's official line. Through their diverse efforts and their persistence, critics such as these have kept the quest for the truth alive. As with most people, I believed the Warren report at first. I think we all had to. We needed to know that there was no nameless they that got away with this, that it had been solved. But the more that was written, the more that we learned, the more questions there were. For every question that was answered, there were 10 more new ones that needed to be answered. And I felt that for, for my own sake, for all of our peace of mind, we needed to know more of what happened to President Kennedy. They didn't tell us the truth. It's a very valid criticism of the Warren Commission that it failed to follow up many, many important leads and witnesses that came to its attention. One of the best examples, I think, is the fake Secret Service man up on the grassy knoll and a Dallas police officer. Within a minute or two after the shooting, Officer Joe Marshall Smith ran up on the grassy knoll following the other witnesses. That's where they all went initially. And Joe Smith pulled his pistol when he spotted a man behind the picket fence up on the grassy knoll. And this was a man dressed in coat and tie. And this man, even looking right into Smith's revolver, said, hey, I'm Secret Service. And he pulled out some credentials that to Officer Smith indicated that he, this man was legitimate. Smith left him alone and went away, investigating other areas in the plaza. The important part is that the Secret Service at no time had any agents anywhere in Dealey Plaza, with the exception of the agents who were riding in the motorcade. So here's a guy passing himself off as a Secret Service agent to a Dallas police officer, and there was no Secret Service agent there. The Warren Commission either didn't know that 
or didn't want to know. They didn't even ask Officer Smith pertinent questions about that encounter. And to me, that's one of the great failings of the Warren Commission. And a typical example how important evidence was overlooked initially or lost at that time. There was some new evidence that came out in uh, late 1976, evidence that I was responsible for, in that the researchers had long been aware of recordings of the Dallas Police Department's radio channels. The department was using two at that time. And some interference began just a couple minutes before the assassination occurred. And that interference continued for five minutes or so after the assassination. And it effectively blocked all police communications on their main channel. What wasn't known was which officer was responsible for it. My thinking was that if the officer were in or very close to Dealey Plaza, his open microphone may have picked up the sound of the shots. From that theory sprang an investigation by the House Assassinations Committee. And after some digging, they found what they thought were the original recordings. They had the scientists analyze the, the uh, recordings and decided that uh, after some, some tests and then firing some test shots in Dealey Plaza and recording those, that there were four shots fired during the assassination, perhaps as many as six. And that, of course, proved conspiracy. For two years, through political turmoil, the House Committee flourished. It investigated areas that needed to be investigated, some that we hadn't thought of before. Others, unfortunately, were overlooked. And as a result, after the dust cleared, we were given a report. The report said, yes, there was a conspiracy, but a very limited conspiracy. There were at least two people firing at President Kennedy. Much of the evidence leading toward involvement of government investigative agencies perhaps in the actual murder, perhaps just in the cover-up, were all pretty much glossed over. Uh, some recommendations were made to the Justice Department. They were never followed through. During the House Assassinations Committee hearings, the FBI and CIA admitted that they had withheld evidence, that they had obstructed justice. Not a single person was ever put to, to task for this. They were just allowed to go, and that's the way it remains till, till this day. We can't know the truth unless we have subpoena power and people that want to know the truth. If they don't want to know the truth, whether because they don't believe in it or because they feel it's politically advantageous to themselves not to investigate it, then we'll never know the truth. But how can this country go on after a quarter of a century of this cover-up? How can we build on that? We're building on a lie. We've got to know the truth. The House Select Committee on Assassinations concluded, primarily on the acoustics evidence, but not exclusively, that there were two people firing shots in Dealey Plaza. And they decided, based on the scientific evidence uh, that took a period of some nine to ten months to analyze fully, that shots number one, number two, and number four all came from the Texas School Book Depository building. But shot number three did come from the grassy knoll to the president's right front. Therefore, it's inescapable conspiracy because there were at least two shooters. So all this means that according to the United States government, there are now two official conclusions as to what happened. The Warren Commission says there was one shooter and three shots. The House Assassinations Committee says two shooters, a total of four shots. There's a conspiracy or there isn't. That's where we're stuck and we have been since 1978. Given the nature of the president's most powerful enemies at that time and who had the most to gain from the assassination, my feeling is that there are four groups that are suspect. The more militarily uh, oriented of the anti-Castro Cubans, the people who felt betrayed by President Kennedy after the Bay of Pigs, the mob who wanted the gaming rights back in Havana, they were losing millions of dollars every day uh, since Castro closed the casinos, the ultra-right wing who hated President Kennedy for virtually everything he stood for, and the ultra-right wing hawks within the CIA, the ones who had been fired, or people related to those uh, politically, who had been fired uh, by President Kennedy after the Bay of Pigs, they all had a common goal. They wanted the president out of the way. They wanted Cuba clear of Castro and the communist threat in the Western Hemisphere. They had the most to gain. They had the motive, the opportunity, and the means to kill President Kennedy. If that is the cake, and the icing on the cake is the president's decision to withdraw the troops from Vietnam. That was the CIA's war. They wanted it, they wanted to promote it, they wanted to push it. The people who I think had most to gain as they saw it were the military-industrial intelligence complex. 
It's a myth that the intelligence agents don't make policy. They make it all the time. They always say they're carrying out policy, and sometimes they are. The people who had most to gain were those who didn't want the peace in the world that John Kennedy had tried to turn the world toward when he and Khrushchev worked out the solution to the Cuba Missile Crisis. The people who didn't want John Kennedy to be president were those who were making incredible fortunes from war production. Had Kennedy lived, I think we'd have had no Vietnam War with all of its traumatic and divisive influences in America. I think we would have escaped that. I think the world would have escaped it. The 50,000 odd Americans dead and uh, 300,000 more wounded and over half a million more hooked on dangerous drugs and tropical diseases. The divisiveness of that war that so many of the people thought unjustified and unnecessary and it shouldn't have been there. It split this country widely and uh, many of those things have lingered on since. Kennedy made a speech at American University in June of the year before he died, and he said, we live in one world, we got to breathe in the same air, and we got to live together, we're going to die together. He was very disturbed by our involvement in Vietnam, which he inherited. And there came a time when he called his generals in and spoke to them, and after he spoke to them, the Pentagon issued a small statement saying that we have re-evaluated our involvement in Vietnam and find that we can begin to withdraw our men. The plan was to begin by withdrawing a thousand a month. Seventeen thousand were to be withdrawn by the time of the election, which was a year later. One plane load reached the United States when John Kennedy was killed. Three days after the assassination, the body wasn't yet in the ground. The Pentagon issued what it called a re-evaluation of its re-evaluation. And they said simply that we found that our re-evaluation was optimistic. And the rest is history. The whole world turned around on it. The world will not, within the lifetime of anybody living today, recover from just that. Kennedy represented the voice of hope, a voice of opportunity, a voice for the future, a uplift. People were, could hardly stand on their feet. They'd jump up and down when he came along the street. And this, this great voice of hope for the future of a better America was still by the assassin's bullets. And people were depressed and uh, mourned over it and uh, thought we have lost our brightest and best in the head. The most important effect once the Warren Report came out was disenchantment and disillusionment, especially of that college generation. I can't tell you how many collegiate audience reflected this. All people of all ages reflected it on the radio talk shows, which spent a lot of time on this. So people lost their faith in the government. And the government earned that loss of faith. And I think perhaps the second is more important, that when the government justifies a loss of faith, it really is a deep subversion. The strongest ally the cover-up has had has been the American media, both because they are unable or unwilling to accept the conspiracy or the fact of the conspiracy, or because they know better and are serving their masters well. One of the two. None of the things that the critics brought to light were treated responsibly by any responsible element of the press. If it hadn't been for the kookiest of all, the radio talk shows, we critics would not have been able to reach the people we did, and they were very important. The Washington Post resisted it, the New York Times resisted it, the major TV networks resisted it. Unless you had something nutty, unless you had something dramatic, unless you had something they knew wasn't true. But substantial criticism never had a voice. And that's what the working of a democratic society requires. Most of all, when it's a crime of the magnitude of the subversiveness of this one, the assassination of a president. If the press would just open their eyes, if the media would accept the fact of the conspiracy, instead of just arbitrarily disbelieving, we'd have some allies. A handful of, of critics and researchers in this case have gotten remarkably far on their own. But if the press would just be honest about it and question and do their job, we could learn a lot more. The fact of the assassination conspiracy is beyond doubt. Only the scope is in question. I'm a first generation American. I'm the first member of my family, born at least since the time of Christ. I can't go back to Adam in, in freedom. None of my predecessors ever had it. And uh, I've been a writer an investigator, reporter, a Senate investigator, an intelligence analyst. And the older I get, the more convinced I become that despite all its failings, we have the best system of self-government man has yet perfected. And it's got so many failings. 
But it, the, the, for the system to work, those who are responsible for seeing to it that it works have to see to it that it works. In this case, it didn't happen. They subverted it instead. They nullified, the assassination nullified our system and the investigation nullified our system. My investigation has been different than that of others who are known as critics because mine is a study of how uh, the institutions of our society worked at the time of the Greek crisis and since then. And obviously, the conclusion is obvious, they all failed. All, on all levels.